So you just got your new camera and you realize that your videos still don't look good. And now you're wondering, why is that? It's probably because you don't have a basic understanding of camera settings. So to help you out with that, in this video we're going to be going over the exposure triangle and then we're going to be going over what frame rates you should be using as well as resolution and white balance. If you don't understand even one of these camera settings, you could be entirely messing up your shot. So make sure to get a pen and a pad of paper to take notes and let's get into it. And get ready because in this video I say basically way too much. I mean it's, it's really bad. I'm a little embarrassed. It was the summer. I had my new Canon camera with me and my new light as well. I was about to have my first music video shoot. But what I didn't know at the time was that I knew so little about exposing shots correctly. So during that shoot, I made the horrible mistake of overexposing my shot. Overexposing basically just means the image is way too bright. And because of that, one of the main performance shots was ruined. So now to help you avoid that terrible feeling of not properly exposing your shots, I'm going to be talking about pizza. Basically when you're setting up a shot, you want to be cutting a perfectly sliced pizza. So what does that actually mean? Basically I'm referring to the exposure triangle, where all three sides of this pizza or triangle are perfectly balanced between the aperture, the shutter speed, and what is called the ISO. When these are all balanced, you get a perfectly exposed scene. And basically having a properly exposed scene just means it's lit to your liking. So now let's actually talk about how to slice this piece of pizza perfectly. So first, shutter speed. Basically, shutter speed refers to how long your camera's sensor is exposed to light in measurements of seconds. So for example, if you set your camera to a shutter speed of 1 50th, your camera sensor would be exposed every 1 50th of a second. A really important rule to follow when you're first starting out to achieve a professional result is setting your shutter speed to double what your frame rate's going to be. And we'll talk about what frame rate to set your camera to later. That's because if you do that, your camera will perceive motion the same way the human eye does, which is the most natural thing for us to look at, and is what also gives us the most cinematic looking movement. Now let's get into the second side of the pizza, which is aperture. Basically, aperture is the opening or hole in your camera's lens, and this lens's opening is measured in what is called f-stops. So basically, if your lens is at a lower f-stop, the lens is going to be more open, and this will allow it to receive more light and make your image in turn brighter. And having a low f-stop or open aperture can cause the background of your shot to get that blurry cinematic look. But make sure not to overdo this because it can be really distracting and actually take the viewer out of the moment. Alright, let's cover the third and final part of our beautiful pizza slice, and that is ISO. ISO basically refers to your camera's light sensitivity, and this is done digitally through the camera. Basically, the higher your ISO is, the brighter your image will be. However, the problem with ISO is that generally, when you raise it, not only does your image get brighter, it also becomes noisier. And this can be a problem when you're aiming for a professional looking video. However, you can use noise as a creative decision. However, if you're doing some kind of commercial or interview, I really wouldn't recommend trying to bump up your ISO super high to achieve that look because normally it's not very desirable in a professional environment. So because of that, ISO should be the final thing that you adjust to properly expose your shot at its lowest possible value so you avoid that noise. However, in some higher end cameras, there's something that's called dual native ISO, which is when they can shoot not only at their lowest ISO very well, but they can also shoot at a higher range ISO. For example, the Lumix S5 II that I'm shooting on right now has a dual native ISO at 640 and also at 4000. And basically what that means is that at 4000 ISO, which is relatively high, there's still gonna be very minimal noise in the shot, which is a very cool feature that you get in higher end cameras to help you shoot in darker environments. So to summarize the exposure triangle, it's really important to set your shutter speed to double the frame rate. Make sure your aperture is open to your liking so you're achieving the blurriness of the background that you desire without overdoing it and also letting in the amount of light that you would like. And finally, make sure that your ISO is at its lowest setting or at its dual native ISO to minimize the amount of noise in your shot. Now let's cover which frame rates you should be using in your videos. So first let's just go over what frame rates actually are. Basically frame rates are measured in frames per second. So on a 24 frame per second timeline, 24 individual frames or still images will be played every single second. And so in 60 frames per second, there's gonna be 60 frames displayed every single second. So the first frame rate that I'm gonna be talking about is 24 frames per second. 
Now this is the most common frame rate that you find in cinema because once again, it matches the way our eyes perceive motion in real life. This causes it to be the most cinematic frame rate and it's what they use in Hollywood productions. Next is 30 frames per second, which is mostly used to capture news and sports events. And that's because it allows the movement in the shot to be smoother than 24 frames per second. Now, one of the main problems with 30 frames per second, besides the fact that it's not the cinematic frame rate that our eyes perceive movement in, is that it is also the native frame rate of most phones these days. And because of that, when we see footage in 30 frames per second, we're gonna associate it with the homemade, low budget films shot on iPhone. So that's one reason that I wouldn't necessarily recommend to shoot on 30 frames per second and use 24 instead. However, I would recommend to use 30 frames per second in a 24 frames per second timeline in post-production because what that allows you to do is slow it down 80% because 24 divided by 30 is 0.8 or 80% and get a really smooth and dreamy look which is amazing for real estate videography, wedding videography, and so much more. All right, now 60 frames per second. Once again, this can be used for sports videography, and that's because when you're panning your camera around super quickly, you wanna be able to capture an image that results in smooth footage so viewers can clearly see what's going on for viewers who are, for example, looking at a football quickly moving up and down the field. Once again, another great reason to use 60 frames per second is for its slow motion capabilities, because if you're shooting in 60 frames per second, you can slow it down on a 24 frame per second timeline to 40% speed, which is the most commonly used frame rate for slow motion video. In professional videography, I would highly recommend editing in a 24 frame per second timeline. And that's because regardless of the frame rate you shoot in, when you slow it down, it's going to have that 24 frame per second look, which is the most cinematic and resembles the same way the eye perceives motion, which is ideal for engaging your audience into your video or film. Now let's go over resolution. The industry standard for resolution is 1080p. And basically that means in a standard aspect ratio, the frame size will be 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. And then there's 4K resolution, which is double that. So if I do some quick math, that's 3840 by 2160. And because it has double the pixels, it essentially has twice the detail as a video that is shot in 1080p. All right, now let's go over some of the pros and cons of using both 1080p versus 4K. So the pros of 1080p is that it's gonna take much less storage space than a 4K file. And once again, that's because there's less detail in the image. Additionally, 1080p files are going to be smaller, which makes them much easier to share with clients because they take up way less storage space and will send a lot faster. And the final pro with 1080p is that in this day and age, there's still not all the frame rates that we have accessible in 1080p in 4K. You'll likely have a wider range of frame rates or at least a wider range of frame rates that don't have a crop factor that the same frame rates in 4K would have. And of course the cons, one of the major ones is that it's going to be lower quality than 4K. And also not being able to deliver 4K video could potentially put off certain clients or prospect clients. Now let's go over the pros of 4K and higher. It's gonna be a higher quality image and it's gonna have a lot more detail than 1080p. Some clients will be expecting a 4K video. So because of that, more clients will potentially be inclined to work with you because you have that higher quality image. If you have a higher resolution than 4K in your camera, definitely let clients know it's just a bit of a flex. You can just say that you can shoot in like 8K for example, and then realistically don't actually shoot in 8K because if you do, you're gonna be taking up all your storage within the first 30 seconds of recording, but it's just a cool way to market yourself as a videographer. So honestly, I don't recommend shooting anything higher than 4K in this day and age. All right, now going over some of the cons of 4K. First of all, of course, it's gonna take up way more storage space than 1080 will because it has that extra detail. Also, like I said in the 1080 list, most cameras are not going to have all the same frame rates they do in 1080 as 4K, so you're likely gonna be limited in the amount of options that you have to shoot in. Finally, if you have a lower end computer, in post-production, you're gonna notice a lot more glitching because there's so much more information on the files. It's gonna take a lot longer for your video editing software to process the footage. So that can be a huge pain in editing. All right, now let's cover the basics of white balance or balancing the colors in our shots. This is primarily done through adjusting the Kelvin setting on our camera. Basically, Kelvin is a measurement of color temperature. It's on a scale from 1000 Kelvin being the warmest and reddest to 10,000 Kelvin being the coolest and bluest. So what does that actually mean for you as a video creator? 
Basically, in a professional environment, you want to make sure your whites are pure white. So to do that, you have to determine what the Kelvin is in the environment you're shooting at. A good way to do that is finding a white object in your space and determining if it's warmer or cooler than white. And you can adjust your Kelvin according to that. So let's say I had a room with a temperature of 7000 Kelvin. On my camera, I would adjust the setting to 7000 Kelvin. However, if you don't have a white object in your room, you can always just eyeball it and, and try to match what you see in real life with what the camera is seeing. Some important numbers in the Kelvin scale is first that 5600 Kelvin is daylight temperature. Also 5500 is a perfect balance between blue and red and is actually considered to be pure white. Another important thing to bring up is that not all projects are going to demand for a perfectly color balanced shot. For example in a sad and depressing movie maybe you want to set your Kelvin to a cooler temperature to help evoke those blue sad emotions. So like with most of these settings, Kelvin can be used for creative purpose as well. Just make sure that you're happy with the color of your image before you hit record, because unless you have a camera that can shoot in something that's called raw, which I won't even get into what that is right now, you're gonna have a really hard time correcting the colors in post without your image falling apart. All right, with all that in mind, make sure to set your camera to manual mode right now and go out and practice and implement everything you've learned in this video. That's the best and fastest way to improve. And if you're someone that doesn't have a camera just yet, there's a link in my description that will allow you to practice exposing your shots by playing around with the exposure triangle. So make sure to check that out. So if you got value from this video, make sure to check out the next video in our series where we'll be mastering the basics of camera composition. I'll see you there.